Let's stand together as we sing.
when I'm on this stage um, next to one of my best friends, Heather Palacios, usually in costume, attempting to make people laugh by making fun of her at all costs, and sometimes, very few times, myself. Tonight, however, I'm here for a different reason. You're not going to get that guy. Instead, you're going to get the guy who's hurting for his friend and her family. So on behalf of the entire Funk and Palacios family, we welcome you to the celebration of Chris Funk's life. From all accounts, Chris didn't take the easiest path in life. Chris battled something millions of people struggle with. That's addiction. However, amid that struggle, Chris worked hard to defeat the stronghold that addiction had on his life by working every day to put God and his relationship with Jesus first. But Chris wasn't alone in his struggle. Everyone in this room has their individual struggles. And for the Funk and the Palacios family, I know the hope is that for something good to come out of this situation. That good could be just one person in this room deciding to end their struggle with addiction, to get the help they need and to make the decision to never turn back. That could be one, just one person realizing they can't do life alone and they need the love, the hope, and forgiveness that comes from having a relationship with Jesus Christ, like Chris did. That good could be just one person deciding to find local, a community of love and acceptance from a local church to help them move forward in their walk with Christ. The Bible's clear. On this side of eternity, we all experience pain, we experience suffering, affliction, and temptation. However, with the power of God, we can choose never to give up no matter what life throws at us. One of Chris's favorite verses was 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says this. It says, therefore, since in the mercy, in his mercy, God has given us this new way, we never give up. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Let's pray. Dear God, it's on nights like this that we get the opportunity to stop and think about our own lives. We get to think about our own mortality. And the good news that Chris believed is that Jesus conquered death. Because he did, we can too. We have the hope of eternity with God because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. In times of great loss, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We are grateful for that truth. Chris understood and accepted that truth. Because he did, he is in heaven now with Jesus. I pray that tonight, God, you are honored and Chris's life is celebrated. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand to your feet as we worship some more?
seated. Hey, everybody. Thank you for being here on a Friday night to um, remember my brother, Christopher Kelsey Funk. Um, when I think of Chris, I think of three things. They all start with the letter S, don't worry. His struggle, his support, and his see you laters. His struggle, struggles. Intoxicated, insomnia, high, hungover. He burned bridges, money stolen from others, robbed from him, unconscious, resuscitated, incarcerated, arrested, hospitalized, homeless, beat up, scarred, hungry, shoeless, a missing person, held at knife point, breaking promises, wandering aimlessly. But I had to really think about those things to make that list. I think about the Bible when I think about my brother. And I immediately jump to 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul said, I've been in prison, whipped, faced, death, beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. I mean, they definitely had that in common. I've traveled on long journeys, faced danger from robbers. I've faced danger from rivers, deserts, seas, endured sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, and I've often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold. But Paul said, if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. I mean, what could my brother possibly boast about? His weaknesses. Because in all of them, when Chris was weak, God was strong. So his struggle, I also think about his support. Now, there's many of you that Chris hit up for money. Just see Raul in the lobby after service. <laughs> he will reimburse you. Over the last 10 years in our home, we've lived with a double tension. The first is how much to help Chris and how much to not enable him. And the second was how much does Raul and DJ and Andy let me help Chris before they step in and protect me? I got it wrong many times. For example, over the last 10 years, I have become very generous towards people asking for money at intersections. Because to me, you know, they were all my brother. But not all parties in our marriage saw it that way. The palpable tension that DJ and Andy would endure in the back seat of the car as we would approach an intersection and see somebody asking for money could have been cut with a knife. There was a silent battle of him and her and what was going to happen. Him, we don't need to do anything. Her, we need to give him cash, credit card, our car, our firstborn, and our secondborn. Sorry, Andy, no offense. But in all seriousness, when I think about Chris's support, I think about all of you guys. In preparing for this, I didn't need to search my Bible very long to find the right verse that goes along with what you guys have done for Chris. In the book of Matthew, it says, for I was hungry and you fed me, and I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And I was a stranger at church by the glades and you invited me in. And I was naked and you would give me clothes. I was sick, you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And all these really cool CBG people replied, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Lord, when did we see you thirsty or give you something to drink? When were you naked, Lord, and we gave you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison, Lord? And the Lord said, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it for Chris, 
You were doing it for me. His struggle and his support, and lastly, his see you Part of Chris's gregarious nature was his see you No matter what he was going through or what he had done, his see you were always seasoned with positivity. But after talking to family, I found three of his see you to not only be predictably positive, but particularly profound. To our cousin Laura, he texted, Laura, thank you for not giving up on me. To him, that was a see you later. To her, it'd be the last time she'd hear from him. To my mom, last week, he had asked for an Uber, and my mom rightfully told him no. You know, boundaries, gotta have boundaries. And the next day, he texted my mom, Mom, I'm not mad today. I don't hold grudges. To him, that was a typical see you later. To her, it was his last words. And to me, his last text was he had asked me to get him an Uber. <laughs> but I was last week, I was getting ready to walk on stage to, to share my story at a church, and I let him know that. And he replied, H, you got this. There are people that need to hear your story. God ordained this moment, and I'm proud of you. To Chris, that was just another see you later. And to me, it would be his last words. Chris didn't leave me in a state or a trust fund. He didn't even leave me a dollar. <laughs> Chris left me with how to see you later in my relationships. I just want to thank you guys for being here and being with Chris for the last 10 years through his struggles, as his support, and in his see you I've lost my comrade in the mental battle. Chris was never my savior, but he was someone to run with. My new normal will be to learn to keep fighting without him. But I have to remember that Chris lost his life. I didn't lose mine. And I will never lose God who fights with me and goes before me. Chris, I love you. But I know where you are. And I know who you are. And I'll see you later. Thanks. looking around I see a lot of folks from CBG but there's some guests in the house as well and if you're new to our church um, this is a big church and sometimes big churches just by nature of dynamic of being big are somewhat impersonal our church is a family it's a, we're highly relational probably to a fault probably dysfunctionally relational and our family we like to have fun and no one is more centric to the party at Church by the Glades than Heather Except maybe Fred. And so, you know, if you were just could blink and be here in two weeks, when this room will be full of pirates and children hyped up on candy, swinging from the rafters, and it'll look like Pirates of the Caribbean, that's kind of the heart of our church. We love joy. We love to have a party. We, we think there's great joy in the Lord. Good families celebrate. Good families high five. Heather, even some hug it out, but we won't hug you. But good families, when one person hurts, they weep together, they grieve together. So um, it's an honor to stand with you guys at all times. Jason, honor, I'm just meeting you, but an honor to stand with you. I'm sorry for your loss. But listen, you're part of the family. And Heather, you and Raul have been family for Lisa and I, even before we, you, were, you were you and Raul. 
we met you guys before you married. I had the honor of doing your, doing your, your wedding many years ago to see your kids come to be and do ministry with you guys for the last 12 years here. So to stand here and provide any small bit of help or comfort, it's our pleasure, our honor. And I'm not sure it's appropriate either. If you can crush a funeral talk, you just did. <laughs> Let me read a brief passage. I won't be long. There's not such thing as a bad short sermon. You're surprised. I know that. Anyways, <laughs> I love 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's a powerful chapter. It's a long chapter in the Bible. And, and 1 Corinthians is kind of a funny book in the Bible because it's actually a letter. It's like, so we're getting just kind of one side of a conversation. Evidently, the Corinthians have probably written a letter generating some questions for the Apostle Paul, and we're reading his responses. So ever try to listen to someone on a cell phone, you're just getting half the conversation, and you try to surmise what's being said on the other side? Well, evidently, based on the question that Paul's answering, some people thought this whole resurrection from the dead, this would be in something called heaven, even Jesus defeating death, it's, it's a cute little fairy tale. It's a nice little myth that Christians tell each other during sad moments like funerals to console themselves. And Paul says, you're dead wrong. He says, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we have nothing to preach. And you have nothing to believe. You see, our faith is based on the biblical and historical bedrock of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul segues from talking about the resurrection of Christ, that he really defeated death on the third day just the way he promised and just the way the prophets predicted. And he's, he pivots and talks about what happens when we die. And in verse 51, one of those encouraging passages in all the Bible begins like this. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we'll all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye. Blink of an eye. I was thinking about, you know, for Chris as he precedes some of us in going to heaven. I wonder, because you know, time and space, those are limited human, earthly categories. I wonder though he's in heaven enjoying everything. He meets the Lord, he sees all the sights, and, and maybe it's gonna be 30, 40, 50 years from now that you finally pass Christian, you go to heaven and you see Chris. I wonder for Chris, that time in between feels like the blink of an eye. He just finishes getting his tour, he turns around, Heather and it's you, and Jason it's you, and there's a beautiful reunion. He doesn't even miss us for a moment. But it says here, in a blink of an eye, the last trumpet is blown. When this trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will be also transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. This is awesome. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks God, he gives us victory. I gotta stop. Who but Christians can commingle death and victory? But here, multiple times because of Jesus, that's exactly what happens. You see, for someone who knows Christ, and knows someone else who knows Christ, and that second someone passes, that first someone has two heads. If you properly theologically process as Christian, you have two complete sets of emotions right now. You're sad because you miss your brother. You're sad because you miss your friend. You're sad because your friends are sad. At the same time, knowing that Jesus has defeated death and given us the victory, we know Chris isn't sad. When the paper said that Chris had died, guess what? They lied. He's more alive now than he has ever been. And the things he struggled with here on earth, they're not struggles anymore. Now, ironically, this past week, and I talked about heaven, and I talked about hell, actually, but heaven, my favorite parts about heaven, it says in the last two chapters of Revelation are the things that will not be in heaven. There's no death in heaven. There's no tears in heaven. There's no suffering in heaven. There's no disease in heaven. There's no addiction in heaven. There's no temptation in heaven. I can't wait for that. I get so tired of the fight with me. But that won't be present in heaven. In case you wonder, is that a cute little fairy tale that Christians? No, it's not. Based on the promise of Christ, thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. I skipped just one verse. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know, and Heather, this last part I chose for you. For nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. 
any love or life or encouragement you pour into, pour into anybody, re- re- regardless of the earthly result, here's a promise, it's never in vain. Yeah. It's never in vain. So based on what Jesus did, we can know life eternal, life without all those problems, life without all that pain, life without disease and suffering and separation and temptation. And we can do all those incredible things through Jesus. So the ultimate hero of the story is Jesus. But today, I propose the lesser hero today, yet still a hero, is Chris. Because he's the reason why we're in this room. You're here because Chris has passed from this life to the next, and you're here because you loved Chris, and you're trying to honor him, and you're grateful for his love in your life, or you love someone that loved Chris, but Chris brought us together. So I would say he's the hero, the hero. Now, I'm not sure how you like your heroes. You know, maybe you like your Marvel heroes. You like heroes in costumes with superpowers. You like heroes that wear capes, and uh, they're not limited by laws like gravity. They're bulletproof. Yeah, those kind of heroes are fascinating, but the heroes I like are the heroes a struggle a little bit? I mean, I like, I like Marvel, but I like the Rocky Balboa kind of heroes. I like the heroes of flesh and blood who are very, very human, yet courageous at the same time. I like Rocky. You know what we like Rocky movies? He gets beat up, never quits. Gets knocked down to campus, and he's bloody, but he gets back up every single time. Chris didn't quit. Chris got messy, and he got beat up. He got knocked down, but he didn't quit. Right. Scripture says, let us not lose hearts in doing good, for in due time we'll reap a harvest if we do not grow weary. We need not to quit. Right. I like my heroes a little messy. I like them. They get beat up and they get back up. Victory in Christ. That's what we've been promised. So Heather uh, met with me, and she was, of course, Heather, and she was kind, yet very directive on what this should look like. And she said the end game of this time together should be this. You know, we know Chris is in heaven. Why? Because he was a good guy and made no mistakes. No, because Chris had trusted Jesus Christ to be his personal Lord and Savior. Chris had his struggles. Chris had his issues. In, in fact, you know, I've heard someone mutter, you know, you know, Chris is way better off now. And I know that's someone alluding to his struggles here on earth. Let me tell you, he's in heaven. When it's your time to go to heaven, you're going to be better off. I don't care if you battle addiction and you're homeless or you live in a mansion and you have a car where a Tesla and a Bentley had a baby. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we'll all be better off. We all struggle. Just an issue of degree. Some struggles are more debilitating than others, but we all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is the hero. See, the Bible teaches this. is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Wonder how God feels about you? He's not mad at you madly in love with you. God loves you, but the Bible teaches our sin separates us from God. And that's not just messy people, that's all people. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That verse, that's that's Romans chapter 3, verse 23, perplexes me. It's it's the worst person you know, it's the best person you know. Because God's standard is holiness, it's his own perfection. But it says in the same book in chapter 5, that God demonstrates his great love for us in this way. We were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took my place. He took your place. That's what Calvary is all about. He did that as a free gift, a free gift that we could be saved. And I, that's open to anybody, whether you're moral or messy, no matter what your battle is, whatever your background. I love John 14, 6. I actually taught this verse this, this last weekend. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible where Jesus says, I am the way. Oh, you've been trained. I am the way. Church by the Glades, if it's underlined, they're nice enough to read that for me. I'm, Jesus, I'm the way. That's so wonderfully wide open. Doesn't matter your background, your brokenness, or your baggage. It says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But no one gets the Father except through me. So Heather said, you know, would be a great, would be a great victory, because we know Chris is with the Lord. We know he doesn't know disappointment. He has a home with the king. He knows peace that we can only begin to fathom. He knows the beauty of heaven. He knows unbroken, unconditional, face-to-face love. But what would be the victory in this life for someone that Chris loves to make their decision, to step across the line of faith and say yes to Jesus today? So so how do you do that? What's, What's the biblical formula? 
But if you go to church by the glades, you can guess where this is going to land. I love Romans 10, 9. In my opinion, it's the clearest verse in all the Bible of how you say yes to faith in Christ. It's not a matter of, you know, denominations. It doesn't matter if you're Protestant or Catholic or, you know, walked in the room agnostic, atheist, whatever your background. If you can bring a tiny little mustard seed of faith to Christ, guess what? Today, you get to be the hero in your own story. Just say yes to Jesus. Romans 10, 9, I think, is on the screen behind me. It says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Good job, church. Lord, Lord, that's, a, that's an older word. It's a biblical word. It's actually just old English. Um, Lord uh, means master, means CEO, means boss of your life, the one who's in control. If you believe, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Look at the last four words. You will be it's not my promise to you. It's God's promise to you. So, Heather, Jason, we love you guys. We're sorry for your loss. But because of Jesus, this loss, from Chris's perspective, blink of an eye. For you, you get to muddle around for hopefully a long time, missing your brother, but grateful for his legacy in your life. But because of the one who defeated death, you will see him again. If you'd like to see Chris, if you'd like to see Jesus, if you'd like to see the life beyond this life, this is your moment right now. I want to lead you in a brief salvation prayer, and then someone will come dismiss us. And again, on behalf of the family, let me just say thank you for being here. At times like this, you know, it, you don't know what to say. Fred, I went to seminary for three and a half years. They never taught us exactly what to say at times like this. Your presence speaks volumes. Just being here and let them know, not hugging Heather at this moment, being here speaks to your love that verse I think somebody I don't know me just one person if it's just one person Chris would say this is all worth it if it's just one person so I want everyone in the room please just to bow their heads close their eyes if it doesn't apply to you just, just a brief moment respect those around you if you're a Christian person pray your guts out right now because someone in this room this is going to be the moment they step across the line of faith if you want to do that it says in Romans chapter 10 verse 13 for everyone who called upon the name of the Lord will be saved and so just take my words, make these your words. No need to pray out loud. God can read your mind. But pray something like this. Pray, uh, Lord Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I want to take you up at your promise. I want to be saved. I want you to forgive my sins. I want you to enter my life. I want you to take me to heaven when I die. I believe that you did defeat death yourself. And you're ready to pass off that victory to me. So I make you my Savior and Lord, and I thank you for saving me. For I make this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. On behalf of the Funk and Palacios family, thank you so much for being here tonight to celebrate the life of Chris Funk. If you're here, and maybe you have additional questions about what it means to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, or you would like to pray with someone, we'll have prayer partners and pastors here at the edge of the stage who would love to answer your questions and pray with you. Uh, as for everyone else, thank you again so much for being here. God bless you. Get home safe. the goodness of God.